building their capacity. Becky and I believe that is really all revolves around the principal coach partnership and really kind of setting this collaborative relationship that focuses on one common mission and vision. And that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. So I want to kind of give you a brief little agenda of what we're going to be talking about. The first part, we're going to give you just a little oversight about who we are. Uh, just a little bit of behind my background, behind Becky's background, so you know who the people talking to you are, and we can give you a little bit of insight. We're also going to talk a little bit about instructional coaching in District 112. We have gone from a, in a short period of time from having no real resources in terms of curriculum, instructional coaches, to having a really successful model, which has really shown uh, significant growth in our NWA, our IAR, in just a two to three year period. Also going to dive a little bit into instructional coaching and what it is and why it's important. So, you know, we're not going to talk about all these strategies, and, but right away, we want to give you just a little bit of background. What, what's the research behind instructional coaching? Why is it such an effective model for increasing teachers' capacity and empowering them? And then last but not least, we're going to talk about the collaboration. We're going to kind of talk about the day-to-day -day and what coaching looks like in our, our building and how Be Becky and I kind of collaborate in all elements of that and how we've kind of created this common vision and mission in terms of how we're gonna lay that out with our staff. And as a result, how successful it's been in just you know, a one to two year period. So before we begin, here's a little information about myself. Um, I look like I'm 12, I promise you I'm not 12 years old. Um, I started off as a Teach for America member, teaching in the inner city of Chicago where I taught second through eighth grade for several years where I then went ahead and became a founding dean of social emotional culture and was able to uh, co-found a charter school building with a, a good friend of mine. The two of us opened it together. From there, I served as a resident principal in the city, both with CPS and a charter school. And then most recently, before becoming a principal, I was in Deerfield where I served as an assistant principal overseeing the instructional elements of the school as long as the, the special education. And then now I am entering uh, my third year of uh, being a principal in this new world of education. So that's just a little bit about myself to kind of give you some background. Uh, I'm going to transition now so you can learn a little bit about Wayne Thomas, and then we'll talk a little bit about Becky. So I think it's important you know a little bit about our school before we start talking about our journey. So like I said, I've been here for about three years. Uh, previously to me coming, we've had the same principal, same leadership in place at our school. And at one point, uh, we were the number one school, or number one elementary school in Lake County, Illinois, uh, which is a really an amazing feat. But what we ended up finding, there was a level of complacency in our, in our school for a period of time. And we went from being the number one school to 12 years of declining scores. And uh, we became the lowest performing monolegal school in our district. Um, along with that, we had a lot of challenges in terms of culture. Uh, we give culture surveys multiple times a year, and we were consistently the lowest in terms of culture surveys for parents, students, and staff. So you kind of went from being on the top of the mountain to the bottom in a real quick place. So upon my first week at the job, uh, I got a culture survey that was handed to me from all our staff members. And on that culture survey, we kind of saw the same three trends. Lack of support, lack of resources, and just didn't ever feel like they were getting the development necessary to do the job. So when I started thinking about that, that was kind of the idea that really started to lay the foundation, what we thought instructional coaching and professional development would look like in our school. And you're gonna kind of hear a little bit about that, but I thought this was important to show you that we kind of did start at the bottom and how quickly we were able to just year after year raising, raising our, our, uh, our IA scores almost double digits. So we're gonna kind of talk to you a little bit about that, but before we go into the process, I do wanna introduce my partner in crime and she truly is my partner in crime. Becky and I do everything together um, Becky, why don't you take it and kind of talk a little bit about yourself and then dive a little bit more into what instructional coaching look like in 112 and kind of best practices, if you would. So, hi, I'm Becky Purse. I, um, this is just, we just uh, implemented instructional coaching this past year, but I've been in the district for almost 17 years now. I was a fourth grade teacher um, at a different elementary school for 13 years and a fifth grade teacher for three of them. And um, I've been part of many different leadership teams in the building and at the district level. And what I found that I was in, in doing some of that work was incredibly passionate about curriculum and supporting teachers. And um, when they had questions and they wanted to do uh, different things in their classrooms or had ideas. And so when the district 
posted positions for instructional coaches, I thought I, it might be a good challenge and I'd make that difficult decision to leave the classroom. So it's just a little bit about me. And then I got placed at Wayne Thomas and a couple other schools to, to coach. And that Michael and I just had a, a great partnership and were able to do a lot of great things um, at Wayne Thomas. You can go ahead, Michael. So I think what's really important, um, having been in the district so long and, and how to implement and what instructional coaches and why our partnership was so important was you kind of need to know where your district and buildings are and um, come from that place and how to implement and utilize coaches. So really where we were as a district was we had this revolving door at an administration level there. We administrators didn't stay for very long, superintendents didn't stay, and curriculum, we had no curricular resources to support student learning. We just kind of teachers were creating whatever um, they could, and there was no consistency, and there was a lack of adequate professional development, and the equity across the district and consistency was absent. And then we came to this time two years ago where we had to close school buildings. Um, so what we had to do was um, make some shifts. And in the last two years, we've come a really long way where we've adopted some curricular resources and implemented them with fidelity. We have improving student, student growth and there's been consistency for the first time across the district. We are finally implementing an instructional framework, which is Marzano's instructional framework. And just the last year we rolled out the instructional coaches. You can go ahead. Um, because this is a brand new role in the district, we had in many skeptical teachers. As with anything new, there are always questions and hesitations. In planning with principals, um, coaches knew the rollout of, co of the instructional coaches was crucial to our success. And one of the things that was really exciting for me was Michael had really prepared and talked with and worked with his building to build the culture that it, it wouldn't be this scary new person in the building. Um, the big question that Michael and I had to think about when we were planning is how do we get teachers to actually see the benefit of having and utilizing a coach and to not just think that this was you know, for struggling teachers or for somebody who um, got a, you know, poor score on their evaluation. Um, in Jim Knight's Unmistakable Impact, he talks about how the principal supports the coach and how that influences um, successful coaching and how well the um, coaching program will do. Um, so this partnership was really um, important throughout the whole year and modeling for the teachers that we were a team. So in this next, um, so what we did was we talked with some of the teachers that we worked with. Um, and this, this video is really was the fear at the beginning is what was coaching going to be like? And we really wanted to know like raw, like true and real emotions from the teachers. Many had no idea what to expect. They were coming off of this past year, the year before of we had implemented new curricular resources. It was the first time that anyone was really held accountable in our district for curriculum, for doing anything with um, fidelity. And there was consistency from one building to the next. So there was this fear of the coaches were the police and we were there to check in on them and see um, what they were doing and report back to administration. Um, we weren't, and we wanted to make that very clear. And it was really important to us that um, both Michael and I presented that this was not the case. We are working together in the building to change this dialogue. So this was just a little bit of what it was like initially. This is Shannon, she's a teacher in the building. When I first heard that instructional coaches were coming to our district, I initially thought it would simply be someone who would come in and check to make sure that I was using the district given curriculum with fidelity, perhaps someone who might report back to the principal and what I was doing in the classroom and almost be that 
that watchful set of eyes. Those were my initial impressions. Then I met our instructional coach and she gave a fabulous presentation about all that she could do to come in and help myself and other educators within the classroom. And I was sold when I found out she could come in and be an extra set of eyes to figure out how to better engage students, how to deliver a lesson better, how to backwards plan a unit. I was 100% sold on this idea of instructional coaches as someone who could come in and help me hone my abilities as an educator in order to do better by my students. So it was a fabulous opportunity. So once I saw everything that she could offer or an instructional coach could offer, I was sold because who wouldn't want to better their practice as an educator? So I think Shannon initially had a lot of fears that a lot of our teachers did. The idea that is this going to be somebody who's going to run back to the principal right away and tell them what I'm doing or what I'm not really well with? And is this going to affect your evaluation? And we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about this because an underlying theme that's going to continue to talk about through this whole process and even when you introduce coaching is trust. What does trust look like? So before we get into that, though, we want to talk a little bit about just your experience with coaching in your district, whether it's been a principal working with you or an instructional coach or a mentor, what does that look like for you? How did you feel? What did that experience, you know, how did that affect you? And then talk to your group a little bit about like what you're hoping to learn a little bit from this session today. So if we could, can we go ahead and break them off into some small groups here and some breakout sessions and maybe groups of four people if possible? So right, right now, now uh, we uh, have... We have uh, uh, 18 participants, we're going to break up into four different rooms, so four to five participants per room. So I'm going to go ahead and create those. You should get a notification. When you're in your room, if you could, go ahead and take your, your, uh, turn your camera on if you have it, and then unmute yourself so you can just uh, briefly introduce yourself and begin that conversation. Great. If, Thank you, Kevin. And we'll go for about two to three minutes. Yeah. Okay. And if you could put some of your thoughts just in the, in the chat, because it's helpful for us to see, you know, what you're hoping to learn or some of your experiences that might be um, a good place for us to see some of that. So right. here we go. Thank you. So Michael, I can broadcast the message to all rooms. Do you want to maybe give them, say, th two to three more minutes? Yeah, I think that's perfect. And then we're going to get a little bit more into the actual the research behind it. And then we'll talk about how Becky and I partner up. And then I'll have them, when we come back, we'll, we'll just remind to, to chat in those ideas to the main chat and go from there. Yep. Those are just really, we just want to have some ideas in terms of if we want to maybe move some things around or maybe answer any questions at the end. I didn't see that. And then Kevin, we'll have one more breakout room at the end. And just okay, great. Same, same process, two or three minutes and we'll go from there. Perfect.
right, ready? Yeah, let's bring everyone back then. All righty. Oh, it's going to count down for one minute. That's fine. No worries. Thanks everyone for um, jumping into those breakout rooms. Um, I know that that might not have been something that you were expecting. <laughs> um, so thanks for having those conversations um, and you know sharing some of your experiences um, or what you're hoping to learn from the session. Um, do we mm -hmm. want? To, does anyone want? I mean, I, I know that not everybody expecting to you know share but is there anybody who wants to share something we can give you like a minute if you anyone want to jump in and share something that they're hoping to learn or what their experience has been like and if not no pressure right no we just got everybody back okay um, becky if you just want to say that again that'd be awesome yeah um just thanks for you know jumping in and um, having conversations in the breakout rooms. We just wanted to know if anybody wanted to share something that they were, you know, hoping to learn or that um, what their experience yeah. with coaching has been. Does anybody want to share something? And no pressure. <laughs> yeah, I would like to share. He did not have another job, but his God will provide. <laughs> That's what he said. Yep. Yeah. He said, I do not know what's next. I do not, I am not leaving you because I have other opportunities. I am. I leave you to make room, and I believe wholeheartedly that my God will provide. That's what he said. Sure there you go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think for, this is Melissa. I'm from Chicago. I think one thing for me Good that I... Who are Melissa? I'm sorry. Um, I think the biggest struggle for me that I just have not mastered yet at this point as an instructional coach um, and leader is just really finding a good system to stay focused with each teacher. Um, I feel like it, I just I end up feeling very scattered in my work with teachers and I'm just really looking for some 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 insight on systems and structures that that work well um, to really stay focused um, in goal setting and, and making very specific improvements with teachers. We can definitely touch on that. I think as we move forward, we'll talk a little bit about, um, but the role can feel scattered because everyone kind of has different goals and different things that they're working on. But um, there's some ways to streamline it and ways to approach things that can be um, helpful and make you feel like you're less all over the place all the time. Yeah, that might be a nice part to talk about when we get into the, the one on co one coaching, Becky. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I'm Teresa from Chicago. Hi, Teresa. Where in Chicago are you from, Teresa? Uh, I don't work for CPS, but um, I live on, in South Shore. Oh, okay. Um, so I used to work for a North Shore suburban school district as well, and I was department chair. And uh, I, would, I also had an instructional coach. And I used to be an instructional coach and a, a staff developer. Mm -hmm. And um, in our system, um, as department chair, I was the primary evaluator. My instructional coach was not in an evaluative uh, position. Um, and uh, the instructional coach would do walkthroughs regularly, so teachers expected it and actually welcomed it. Mm -hmm. um, and, every, and every week, I would sit down and just do like an overall uh, like meeting with my instructional coach where she might list just overall issues. She wouldn't name particular teachers unless it was something that, you know, was being, that, that was just overt. Um, yeah. Something that was dangerous either for them or the students. So it was, um, it was actually a, a good uh, partnership. Um, none of my evaluations individually were based on what the instructional coach did, but my uh, professional development was based on that, um, based on common concerns that she noticed throughout 
uh, the department that that teachers were exhibiting or or talked about. So it was actually a great relationship. No, that's amazing. That yeah, that's I'd have to say that's common. One of the rarities. I feel like most people have uh, the opposite effect. So that's amazing to hear you had such a positive you know experience. Yeah, and we're definitely going to touch on some of those things. Anyone else? Okay, why don't we go into the research a little bit. So it's really, when we talk about professional development, what is really important to take a look at, and I think this screen, if you just kind of take a minute to um, let it resonate for a minute of like the different types of professional development and its impact on teachers, um, we see where the actual use in the classroom and how teachers develop skills, where that actually is most effective. Um, with the knowledge of this, Michael and I knew we needed to establish a system that fostered individualized professional development. So teachers would utilize new skills in the classroom. And when we look at this, and I know that many of us have <laughs> at times been in a uh, one size fits all professional development, or we've been part of, you know, just like a class that is just about theory or discussion. But when it comes back to actually using it in practice, um, we look at that 95% at the bottom there where um, coaching in the classroom or coaching with a teacher, the likelihood of it being used in the classroom and used well is 95%, where some of those other areas are zero and 5%. Um, we look at where we spend our time and our energy. And this form of PD is really individualized for teachers. Um, this model really does hit home, um, I think, to a lot of us in the experiences that we've had. Um, I know there were trainings that I went to at times that um, I was excited to try something new. Or um, when I returned to my classroom, it was, um, this is going to be great. And then I get there, I get overwhelmed, um, I get busy and I couldn't sustain that. And I didn't have necessarily the knowledge or the people to go to, to a kind of refresh my memory on the things that I had learned. So coaching really meets teachers where they're at and allows them to set goals based on um, the students' needs in the moment. And that's really why this research um, and shows that coaching is really the best form of PD for teachers. So does one-to-one -one coaching, helping a teacher set goals and providing tailored feedback to enhance teaching, improve teacher's practice? Um, researchers Matthew Kraft and David Bozar examined about 60 studies um, and sh that showed, or excuse me, examined what 60 studies showed about the efficacy of coaching for strengthening teachers and lifting student achievement. And their two word conclusion was <laughs> coaching works. And I think that when we think about what can have the most impact on our students and we, when we go back to the, even the previous slide that, I, that we just shared is that we're not all in the same place. Our students aren't all in the same place. And what one teacher needs or has goals for with their one particular class that year isn't um, always the same as what another um, teacher has. And so this really allows for some individualized PD. So in this video, Shannon um, is that same teacher. She's just talking about her decision to work with a coach and um, how it continued and um, really leveraged some of the things that she did within her classroom. I first decided to work with our instructional coach when I was implementing a modified center system that I have done every year, but I always change it up a little bit for the students. And our instructional coach happened to just be popping into classrooms on that day. And she was there when I was starting to implement it. And so during a break, I sought her out to ask her questions about what she thought, how it looked, what she was thinking maybe could be better. And after talking with her for a couple minutes, she suggested that perhaps she could come on into the classroom and observe, just be an extra set of eyes, and see it from an outside perspective. 
and then maybe she and I could sit down together and talk about it. And so we did after she observed it. And it was just great because she was able to give suggestions or um, many positives. She also gave many positives, but she was able to give suggestions of maybe things I could tweak or change that might make it better from things that she saw on her outside perspective. And what I love the most is everything that she said was a suggestion and a conversation. Nothing was a, you must do this. This is what needs to be done for your students. It was all, well, what if you tried this? Or what about that? It, it was all just a back and forth discussion. And she readily admitted that I know the students best and she was just seeing a little snapshot of them. But those were things that she saw that maybe could change from her perspective. And it was just such an open and honest conversation that I became hooked on instructional coaching and her feedback and her assistance in helping me become better and do better by my students. And so after that, then I was eager to work with her even more. So invited her into the classroom to see other opportunities for student engagement and how I could improve those. And then we worked to sit down together to backwards plan units to make it even more streamlined for my delivery and target standards for the students. And it just went from there. I just became addicted and absolutely loved working with our instructional coach because it did nothing but make my life easier. So it was absolutely fabulous. It was so great in order to work with that outside perspective and someone who could just be knowledgeable about curriculum and different instructional strategies and help me implement them as the educator. So what was, what's our approach is, is where we really want to, um, what we want to get into. And one of the most important parts of the principal coach relationship is making sure you're on the same page. The last thing we wanted to do was co have um, communicate different things to the staff. Um, and the only way that this could occur was through communication and collaboration. So to start the year, um, Michael and I had a meeting to lay the groundwork for what the goals were for the teacher. And much like I think it was Teresa, you said, um, I wanted Michael to share with me. It was a new building for me. Michael was a new principal that I was working with. And um, I just wanted him to share with me like what were his goals for the building? What were some of the things that he was seeing um, that he wanted to improve it? And as a school as a whole, like what were some of the issues? And like, but then I can be kind of on, on the lookout and aware of them, or do I see things different? But I needed to hear from him first, because if I just went in with my own agenda, that wasn't going to work either. And um, so the, having that understanding of what his goals were and the direction he wanted to move with the staff was really important. And Michael also was able to share with me how he envisioned the role of a coach. It wasn't one specific, like, this is what a coach does. This is what a coach is. It was kind of a, a role that was being, what was evolving. Um, so he was able to explain his goals. And he had done such a wonderful job of setting up the culture before my arrival. Um, he set the expectations for working with a coach. And Michael explained that working with me was completely voluntary and it wasn't just meant for classroom teachers or teachers who felt they were struggling and so we planned as, as Shannon in one of her videos had mentioned for me to present to the staff what a coach does and all the different ways coaching can be done and at the end of this you'll see um, kind of a, a menu some of the other coaches and I had put together so teachers um, knew different ways in which we could support them. Um, we also wanted teachers to know that um, it isn't about um, just do you have something that you are struggling with. It could be you have a particular population of kids this year and you have to change up the way in which you do something. And um, some of the things that, you know, on this slide you can see are, um, as Jim Knight explains, it's, you know, one of the easiest ways the principal can um, support a coach or any you know instructional coach is giving you that time and respecting that time and letting teachers know that that time um, is important and so there's 
um, weekly check-ins, confidentiality, which we're going to get to in a little bit, but that's really, really important. And as um, like we can talk about issues in the building, but we're not going to go into classrooms and then go back to the principal and like say, can you believe this is going on in this room or, you know, that, and that comes into the building trust, which we're going to get to as well. Um, also, um, according to Jim Knight, who we've done a lot of research with and um, built our program around some of his, you know, philosophies and the way in which he teaches, he says re researchers correlated teachers participation in coaching and principal support um, behaviors and found that teachers are much more likely to participate in coaching when the principal treats coaches as valued professionals and endorses the coach and provide, provide support to the coach. And Michael did all of those things. I was just another member of the staff. And um, that was so important for them to see. I wasn't like another administrator. Um, he, and I w was another person who could actively participate in making instructional decisions. So that was really important. So this is really interesting and might be um, something for those of you who are coaches out there or even administrators. Um, we, at the presentation to the staff, you know, our first mission was to build trust. And it was very important to be transparent um, and have honest conversations with teachers. They needed to know that I was not going to their classrooms and running back to Michael and saying like, Do you, can you believe this? And of course, I could share what um, who I was working with with Michael. That wasn't a bad thing. Um, if they wanted, I might share what we were working on, but it was really identifying, you know, more of the bigger issues in the building, but helping teachers with the things they specifically wanted to work on. Um, and those things were confidential. So what is coaching? It is evidence-based. It's developmental based on the individual's goals and growth. And no two teachers in the building are in the same place and it's supportive. And the most important bullet there and what it is, is it's confidential and founded on trust. Um, what it isn't, and these were the things that we found were the real, real fears of teachers is that there were gonna be judgments and it was gonna be based on opinion. And it was the competition of who can you know, do this the best. The big thing was it was evaluative. Teachers were really fearful that this was gonna somehow impact their evaluations and making sure that in the, in the building relationships component that this wasn't going to impact their evaluations. And Michael's gonna to talk to that a little bit. Um, and then no data or conversation that we were collecting or any of the like work I was doing and observations I was making, that was for them. That was not, for me to go share elsewhere unless we were using it to do some kind of a presentation um, to show the um, impact of the work that we were doing. Um, Michael was incredibly responsive to me and sometimes he could help like what one way that we built this, what trust in this established this confidentiality with teachers was if there was something I noticed was a bigger issue and I went to him and was able to say, hey, you know, we need this here or I'm noticing this in the classroom, but it's really not a teacher problem. It's a system kind of problem. He was super responsive to me. And that also bridged the gaps gap with teachers is like, oh, she's actually willing to advocate for us too. Um, and I kind of was in that murky kind of place of being a middle person. I was a teacher. I'm not an administrator, but I was working with all administrators and, um, and teachers. And so I had to be very careful in that role with them. Yeah. And I think that leads us to trust, right? And I think one of the biggest challenges in any relationship, is whether it's, you know, two kids interacting, a teacher and a teacher, a teacher and a principal, or even a teacher and instructional coaches building trust. And like Becky, Becky said, a lot of times when instructional coaches come into a school, it automatically turns into, was, like, well, was this an admin? Are they going to tell everything to their principal? So we were very deliberate in terms of how I rolled out trust in our building. And, you know, Roosevelt says it really well. Nobody cares what you know until they know you care. So we kind of took this approach to start the first two months of the school year where it was just be, this approach would just be seen and be helpful. Um, I saw the value that Becky could bring to the team. So I invited her to everything. Becky probably thought I was crazy because her schedule filled up so quickly, but she was in our MTSS meetings, our grade level meetings, our content meetings, you name it. Becky was in meetings all day long. And the only ask I gave of Becky was just to be seen and be helpful. 
Um, we were never pushing coaching at all for the first couple of months. So, you know, we had examples where during our uh, problem solving team meeting, we had one student who was having an issue with some of his phonics. We wanted to make sure that we did some kind of spelling inventory to get some more information. Teacher was really flustered. Becky jumped at the opportunity. Let me give the spelling inventory. We had some teachers who wanted to give some kind of interest uh, surveys for their students to help figure out books at their level. But they were really worried about when they were going to do it. Becky jumped at the opportunity. So we just wanted the first two, three months to really just have Becky just be seen as somebody helpful, but not push coaching at all. From there, you know, I had been in the building for about a year already, and I started doing some instructional coaching rounds with some of our teachers. I started reaching out to our best teachers the ones I've been working with. And I said, you know, would you mind this round, me not working with you? I really think Becky can offer something that I can. Would you work with them? And they all said yes. And all of a sudden what started happening in our building was all of our teachers started looking like, wow, they're, they're working with Becky. You know, I thought coaching was just for teachers who weren't doing well. And all of a sudden in the break room, we started talking about, you hear teachers being like, oh, I'm working with Becky in this writing unit. It's going really well. Ears started to perk up and people started to really listen. You know, and Becky and I really created ground rules. We never met behind closed doors. We never made sure that we were in public laughing or whispering. We wanted to kind of give this mentality that there was this level of confidentiality. And we created this rule that is in place today. It's incredibly still effective. Anytime a teacher elects to work with Becky, if they pick an area, whether it's, you know, let me backtrack real quick. Anytime I do any type of observation with a teacher, either informal or formal, I make it a point that I sit down with them and provide feedback. I don't do it via email. No matter if it's a pop-in, maybe it's 10 minutes, I always sit down and provide feedback. I share with them, I think, what went well, and I think of an area that I think they can improve on. And I always encourage them to reach out with Becky. And I always tell them the exact same thing. If you reach out to Becky and you work on an area, that area moving forward is non-evaluative. I will not evaluate you on that. I'll give you feedback, but that is a safe zone because you are taking the opportunity to grow yourself. And that alone started to kind of push the wheels to this trust relationship that people felt like they could work on areas, not just come up with like fluffy goals or areas they want to grow up, but like real areas they actually knew they wanted to develop in a safe environment, knowing that when that Danielson River came around, that area was going to be blank. And that really, really started to push the movement a little bit or teachers becoming more comfortable and having that level of trust. And so in building that trust, um, they were able to start to see the value of instructional coaching. Um, we could work together. We could reflect a lot um, on their instruction. Teachers started collaborating with each other and conversations became um, more instructionally focused. Um, it encouraged a more there was already a really positive school culture in the building but it, it just it just made it even better because p some of the teachers were finding oh well now I, I understand this resource I didn't have time to you know sit and go through it but with you know working with the coach it was a I was able to get you know a much easier view of how to figure it out and now they were talking with each other and really um what I've learned from my coach, I've worked with Lisa, um, is that you're building the capacity of teachers in the building. And, uh, and by doing that, um, they eventually don't rely so much on you. They start teaching each other and working together. And so um, with that, it became a much more supportive environment. They were supportive of each other. They were patient with each other. And um, I think that they started to see the value of a coach is just there to do just that, coach you. And it sometimes works well, and sometimes we have to try again. So, Becky, would you mind if we skip this slide? Because I want to make sure we continue yeah, awesome. what we actually do. So, I want to talk about what do we actually do to provide coaching support. And you can see a picture here, here, Becky, working with the team. You know, as a principal, uh, especially as a newer principal, I quickly realized that that old saying, "You wear a lot of hats." That that's not a joke. Uh, instructional leader, cultural parents, budgeting, communication. I quickly began to realize that I couldn't be the sole instructional leader in the school. And I realized that, that my instructional coach, Becky, we, we had so much of an opportunity to steer this ship together and empower teachers to really slowly but surely for them to be the instructional leaders of the school. So I want to talk to you about really these four areas, the one-on-one -on -one coaching, the backwards planning of the units, how we support a data analysis today, and whole school professional development. These are the four main areas that we really use to help support teachers. And I think this is gonna give you kind of an idea in terms of how Becky and I collaborate 
to make sure these things come to life. So the first one is personalized Hi, coaching. Lizzie. And I'm going to pause Lisa. We'll get to her in a second. But one-on-one coaching looked a lot of different ways. But my role in coaching was really through the evaluative process. And I talked a little about this earlier that I would work with a teacher and no matter any time I worked with them, I'd always provide them feedback. And I'd always sit down with them, always encourage them to meet with Becky. And one of the biggest pushbacks I always kind of heard from teachers is like, I want to, but I have a family. I got a great papers. I got to listen to Seesaw. When am I going to do this? So Becky and I would always sit down. We'd always try to problem solve. When can we find time to, for teachers to work on their craft during the school day? Because there's enough going on on a day-to-day basis for teachers and they're already overworked. So Becky and I would always just come down to really two simple decisions. Either we try to find a, a, a half day sub and we give them time during the school day. And as you can see down here with Doreen, or the alternative was I would go in the classroom and teach. So there was probably a good three days a week where I was in the classroom for a couple hours teaching a classroom. So Becky and the teacher could meet and talk. It was basically that ability where Becky and I communicated and we're like, how can we help support this teacher? Why do we support this teacher? And how can we collaborate together? And there'd be times where Becky would jump into their classroom and substitute teach for a day. And I would go help with a teacher and coach them. So we kind of started creating that relationship where we knew that deep down for us to provide effective coaching support, it had to be something that they could fit in their day and not something extra. And Becky, do you want to talk a little bit more about like what coaching actually looked like for you and how you kind of managed it uh, on a day-to-day basis? Because you ended up working with, you know, almost like 70% of our staff at the end of the year. Yeah. And the neat thing was it wasn't just with teachers, like in one of these, this is a reading development teacher. I worked with EL teachers. Like, so I think the real piece is that I was in two buildings. um, And so trying to kind of keep your schedule, um, in a way that you can be most effective. If you take on too many teachers at one time and try to work through coaching cycles with them and um, it it makes it very difficult to actually be the kind of support you need to be because you can only kind of have to be there. So the way in which I felt less scattered was I knew the people who were really engaged in following through and needed the support and had goals and questioned me. And there were other pieces. And so when I'd get in their classroom, it might be I'd come in and I'd observe, like with one of these teachers here, she had she had some challenges in her classroom, but she wasn't really sure where to approach. So I did um I did I'd come into her room and I would um start by just doing some observations. She was interested in motivation and engagement. So I really wasn't always observing the teacher. It was a lot of times the kids. You're looking and taking data on that. And then what I did was um, I, we'd have a meeting together. We'd talk through it. Then sometimes we'd do some planning. I'd often model a lesson and then we'd talk about that and then come back in and see if things had changed. Sometimes things had, sometimes things hadn't. Sometimes it was, um, we needed to go in a different direction. We found out that maybe it wasn't a motivation issue. Maybe it was a content issue that it was really too difficult and we needed to differentiate a little bit better. Um, so it was spending a lot of time in room. Now, that doesn't mean that I didn't work with other teachers who wanted to work with, but they may not have gone through a full coaching cycle. I might have come in and just, you know, help support, like, you want to get something more organized and do something, well, this is how we might be able to do it so that this can run more smoothly in your room. Um, You can't work with 10 teachers and coaching cycles at one time. It's nearly impossible. But I did find the days that I wasn't at Wayne Thomas, Michael was texting me like, when are you going to be here next? Like, the so-and-so is looking for you. And um, it was um, it was hard. It was very hard to manage. But yeah. the teachers the teachers did enjoy it. And then I found other time to meet with them. And to Anna, to your point, did we work with every single teacher in the school? We did. Uh, it may not have been Becky working with every single teacher in the school, but you know, if we were in my office right now and I'd show you, but unfortunately the landscapers are going crazy. I have binders on my desk right now where I was going through coaching cycles with a variety of teachers as well. And that was really the value a lot of times with Becky and I sitting down in our one-on-one meetings where we'd sit down and talk about and collaborate together. How can we best support teachers as best as possible? And I would share a lot of the information with her and she'd probably provide me some support. So yes, every teacher was getting a one-on-one coaching. Obviously the level and support of what that looked like definitely differed, um, but we were supporting the whole school towards the end of the year.
think there's more. Sorry, it's difficult from here. Yeah, absolutely. We actually are going to be, Melissa, attaching some templates um, in terms of how we did backwards planning, how we were doing our uh, data analysis meetings. All of those are going to be available to you. Um, I don't think we have anything in terms of like how we organize it, but I can definitely, Kevin, if that's okay with you after this is over, send something over to you and we can put that in the resources because um, I've got something that worked for me, but Becky may have something that worked for her in terms of templates. Um, I'm very much pen and paper. I think that's great. I got a million binders, but Becky is definitely more digital. So we could definitely get you something, Melissa, to kind of see how we organize things. Uh, yeah. And then in terms of how long did a cycle for coaching generally last? Uh, we would usually go through about a, a four to six week cycle with every single teacher uh, where we would work with them um, initially on a skill, popping into their classroom once or twice a week. Uh, and then after those four to six weeks, you know, we'd obviously take a pulse check in terms of how that did. A lot of times what that would look like, Melissa, is after the four to six week cycle, the teacher would invite me back into the room where I would then sit down and be like, oh yeah, like that was amazing. I, I love the, the growth that you've made on this or hey, have you thought about changing this a little bit? And then from that meeting, a lot of times with observation, I'd say, awesome. You know, one other thing that I noticed I think might be able to improve a little bit is this, maybe your next coaching cycle could focus on that. And then once again, the coaching cycle would start up again. And it would really depend if it would be something that Becky was a little bit more of a, an expert area on or myself. Uh, and we'd go from there again. So it would be uncommon for Becky to work with someone for four to six weeks for, you know, three months in a row, or it could be something where kind of just flip flop back and forth um, and go from there. And a coaching cycle can be short. Um, if it's something um, that they, that the teacher really catches on quick and runs with, and it could be something very quick. It doesn't have to be a four to six week. It doesn't have to be a certain time frame, but it can be something short. Um, and everyone just to be coached doesn't have to go through a coaching cycle. It is a great place to um, go and really get deep um, data and really help kids and keep them kind of you know, target some, have a targeted purpose, but sometimes there's just something really small that a teacher wants to tweak and it happens very, very quickly and they run with it. Sometimes it leads to something more. So Becky, why don't you jump into the backwards planning right now and then I'll, yeah. I'll grab the chat here and see what we can do. So what yeah. Well, this is just, and so for some of you in terms of templates, we did a lot of this. We had a new resource um, in our, uh, uh, curriculum uh, this past two, in, over the past two years and the, the literacy was really challenging. What we were finding was a real issue with teachers is teachers are planning day to day um, and they really weren't looking where they were going. So when we were talking about like learning intentions and success criteria with them and how do they know if their students are learning the information, they really didn't have answers. So we spent a lot of time really teaching teachers how to backward plan. And so mm -hmm. Michael was really generous in, in you know, getting some half day subs and letting me spend time planning a unit with teachers. Not that we would plan an entire unit at one time, but looking at the end, what do we want them to know and be able to do at the end so that um, we could make effective decisions, whether it was small group, whole group, right from the start, what are we prioritizing in this unit? So we as coaches and some of the other coaches I work with created a template for writing and for reading. And it doesn't just have to be for the resource that we use, but um, that helped them organize some of what they were doing and made for more intentional planning, which was very foreign to a lot of our teachers. Yeah. And it was just a way um, that teachers had a safe space to kind of ask questions and, and say things that they felt were, you know, is it okay that I didn't know this? Well, yeah, you really haven't had a lot of PD and structure up until this point. So this, let's this. Becky, I want, want to make sure we're good on time. This okay. is where a lot of what you're going to see is a trend here is all of our coaching happened in the school day. Whether if I couldn't find half day subs to support this learning, because I really think it's important because the idea of a teacher being able to go to work and be like, you know, what? I don't need to worry about grading this paper right now. I need to worry about this plan. I'm just going to focus on instructional planning. This is where a lot of times I would be in a classroom or my AP and I would be in a classroom together teaching for two and a half hours to give the teachers the time necessary. And what we found after doing two or three of these cycles is that the amount of teachers who wanted to backwards plan every single unit was unbelievable. And, and this was just one of the elements. The, the key element, we're going to skip Shannon today because I know we're short on time. The biggest piece for us was the data analysis meeting. 
I put a picture of a door on here because this opened the door for everything. We changed our whole approach in terms of how we looked at data. You know, we give NWA, which I think many of you are familiar about three times a year. And then afterwards, about a week later, we look at data analysis together. This time around, we completely changed it up. I met with every single teacher prior to going over the, their data. There was some laughter, there was some crying, and there was some tears. But it was really important because I wanted to create a culture where when we got to these data analysis meetings, we weren't feeling scared or worried about our data. I left every single one-on-one -on -one meeting, which is the common phrase that like, your data is your data, and it's in the past. I don't care about what your data says anymore. You could have been the highest performing teacher in the district. I don't care anymore. What I care about now moving forward is what plan are you going to be putting in place? And we were able to put together a, a phenomenal structure. We were able to bring Becky and I in, and we worked with teachers on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And at the end of every data analysis meeting, which is about three or four hours, we always said to them, you've got one opportunity now to grow. How are you going to push your kids? And we gave them an option. You know, you can meet with Becky and backwards plan. You could create formative assessments. You could, um, I can't remember the last one, so I apologize. But at the end of our meeting, I said, now there's a level of like, what's going to happen next? And every teacher had to pick something. And I told them every week we were going to check in, in terms of how we're making forward, how we're doing towards that progress. So there was that level of accountability. And what we started to see was every single teacher in the school was starting to request meetings now because they weren't embarrassed about their data anymore. They weren't embarrassed that like they knew they had to work on something. So everyone was either working with Becky or myself. And that's what we were using a lot of our coaching cycles in. But we went from our first year, we were projected to grow 2% uh, in our IAR. We went up 10%. And our culture scores went from being in the bottom to being number one for student staff and, and teachers in the whole district. You're averaging around 90% of our staff highly engaged and satisfied with the work that we were doing. And this was the key that really opened the door and opened the floodgates for coaching and culture in our whole building. That was probably a lot, Becky. I apologize. I was I'm very passionate about our data analysis. Meeting. No, I, yeah, and I just feel like I'm, I'm being mindful of the time, and I know we're yeah. So, over. Kevin, where are we at, sir? So, <laughs> uh, actually, if we could wrap up, uh, any, any closing thoughts uh, that you'd like to share? Um, I, I think that this has just been fantastic. Just a reminder, um, we will have this recording posted. Um, on our Edmentum Illinois YouTube channel, as well as those resources available um, that we talked about during the keynote. So, yep. um, Michael, Becky, I'm I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that that you would be fine with someone reaching out for uh, questions or anything. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm happy to share any resources and such. I think it just all comes down to, like I said, the building and coach coach relationships with the principal having that similar mindset around how do we grow teachers and what kind of sacrifices are we willing to make. Um, every single kid in the school knows my name because I've been in every classroom probably teaching every single day. But that's the kind of sacrifice I think needs to be made because teachers shouldn't be expected to do more work outside of school. We already asked them so much to do as it is. How can we support their learning in the building and how can we give them the resources necessary to be successful? And Becky was phenomenal in terms of being my partner and being able to provide that. Thanks. And the last slide, though, just if you go to, it's, it's yeah. some of, the, or there is a real interesting survey that we gave is what a coach is and what a coach is not. Um, was really great to give staff a sample coaching menu of things you can, a way to kind of get yourself in the door. And then oh, the, the data analysis sample template that Michael was talking about, you know, of giving teachers an accountability. Uh, and then they often open the door to work with a coach. It opened the door to work with a coach. So, um, and we can share some other of the backward plan. Yeah, and, I, and I'll, I'll find the, the coaching template for you guys. It's very similar to anybody's done writer's workshop that you work with your students on when you walk around with their journals, very similar model. Um, that's about all our time. I want to thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, everybody yeah. who chimed in. Um, You've got our Twitter handles, send us some messages. We're happy to talk. Uh, and I just want to wish everyone a uh, good luck this year in our new norm of education. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So much, Michael, Becky. Really appreciate it. And uh, if you're heading to your next session, go ahead and uh, click on that link. And uh, we'll see you there.